So this video is a problem session which is based on the material that was covered in the first two weeks of this course. The main intention of uh, the problem session is to supplement the problems that have already been uh, given in your assignments. So I hope that you have given a considerable amount of thought to the problems that were given in your assignments. So let us now look at a uh, few more problems. Okay. So problem 1. So, the problem 1 is as follows, let V be the set of all elements x, y such that x, y are in R, basically it is the Cartesian product of R with itself, define vector addition in V component wise. and scalar multiplication as follows. What is the scalar multiplication? The scalar multiplication is a times x comma y is equal to x comma 0 for all x comma y in capital V and A in the field of scalars. So, the problem is to check is V a vector space with these operations. So, notice that we are looking at the same uh, set V which is uh, R2. The only thing is we are tweaking the uh, vector addition actually vector addition is the same. The scalar multiplication has been tweaked to the new one which is underlined in green and our task here in this problem is to check whether V is a vector space with these operations. Alright, so what do we need to uh, do in order to establish this or solve this problem. So, let us look at a solution. The first thing to notice is uh, first thing to check is whether V is closed under vector addition and scalar multiplication. So, the vector addition, so recall the vector addition which is component wise is given by x1 y1 plus x2 y2 is equal to x1 plus x2 component wise y1 plus y2 which is an element in capital V for all x1, y1 and x2, y2 in capital V. So, this is something which we have already seen in the case uh, in the example where we check that R2 is a vector space because the vector addition in this problem is the same as the vector addition there. So, yes, V is closed under vector addition. How about scalar multiplication? So, scalar multiplication. So, let x comma y be in R2, um, orbit, sorry, in V. Uh, v is the same as R2, but let me just call it V because that is what uh, the vector space is being called as. So, let x, y be in V and uh, C be an element from the field of scalars. Then C times the scalar multiplication. How is it defined? C times x y is x comma 0, which is an element in capital V, right? It is after all uh, an element in capital V which has the second coordinate 0. Recall that V is nothing but the set of all tuples x comma y with x y in R, right? So, yes, so this is also in V. So, hence V is closed under both vector addition and scalar multiplication. We take two vectors and look at the vector addition of that, that gives you back a vector in, uh, okay. So, if you take two elements in V and if you look at the addition component wise, it is giving back 
an element in V and therefore it is closed under vector addition and similarly if you take any element x comma y in any scalar look at the scalar multiplication as defined here it is giving us back an element in capital V and therefore V is closed under vector addition and scalar multiplication. Okay, so what is now uh, needed to be checked for these two operations properties 1 to 8 need to be checked all the properties 1 to 8 listed in the definition of the vector space should be satisfied for V to be a vector space with these operations. So, let us now check the properties involved in the definition. So, let us now check for uh, the properties 1 to 8 which is listed in the definition of the vector space. So, property 1. So, what was the first property? Property 1 dealt with whether this vector addition is uh, commutative. So, let us take two vector uh, two elements in V. So, x1 y1 and x2 y2 be in capital V. What do we need to do? We need to check that if v1 and v2 are two vectors in capital V, two elements in capital V, v1 plus v2 should be the same as v2 plus v1. So, let us see what is x1 y1 plus x2 y2. x1 y1 plus x2 y2 is just component wise addition which is x1 plus x2 y1 plus y2. And what is, uh, so notice that uh, x1 plus x2 is just uh, addition of two scalars. So, notice that x1 plus x2 is equal to x2 plus x1 and similarly y1 plus y2 is the same as y2 plus y1. Why is this the case? Because addition of scalars is commutative, real numbers if you add in whatever order you wish the answer is going to be the same that is the reason. So, let us call this star and call this observation star star. Then what is uh, x2 y2 plus x1 y1 this again by component wise addition is just going to be x2 plus x1 comma y2 plus y1 just component wise addition and by star star this is equal to x1 plus x2 y1 plus y2 right. So, let me write this by star star here by star star and what is this? This is equal to x1 y1 plus x2 y2 by star above. So, basically what we have established is x2 y2 plus x1 y1 is the same as x1 y1 plus x2 y2 thereby establishing commutativity. So, yes property 1 is satisfied, property 1 is satisfied. Okay, now, let us look at property 2, property 2 dealt with uh, associativity. So, if you take three vectors v1, v2, v3, the question of whether if you look at v1 plus v2 plus v3, the question of whether v1 plus v2 is added first and then added to v3 should not matter as compared to whether v1 is added to the vector addition of uh, v2 and v3. So, so, let for that we need to take three vectors v1, v2, v3, uh, three elements v1, v2, v3. Elements here typically look like x1, y1 x2 y2 and x3 y3 v1 v2 v3 v elements in capital V. So, we are interested in what is x1 y1 plus x2 y2 plus x3 y3 whether this is the same as yeah we will come to that. So, this if you notice this is just equal to x1 plus x2 y1 plus y2 plus x3 y3. We added the first two vectors first and now this is going to be equal to x1 plus x2 plus x3 y1 plus y2 plus y3. But what do we know about the sum of scalars, sum of real numbers? We know that that is a 
associative uh, addition right so this is equal to x1 plus x2 plus x3 the order here doesn't matter so we will make use of that to, to write it like this but notice that this is nothing but x1 y1 plus x2 plus x3 comma y2 plus y3 and what is this this is nothing but x1 y1 plus x2 y2 plus x3 y3 and that establishes that property 2 is satisfied so hence property 2 is satisfied so what was property 3 property 3 talked about the additive identity the existence of a zero vector so my claim is 0 0 is the zero vector for the vector addition so in particular 0 comma 0 is an element of capital v so if you look at x comma y plus 0 comma 0 what do we have this is equal to x plus 0 y plus 0 but any number added to 0 should give you back the same number so this is equal to x y so any vector v added to the 0 vector is giving us back v so yes property 3 additive identity does exist property 3 is satisfied how about property 4 property 4 talked about additive inverse given any vector v we would like to look for another vector w such that v plus w is the zero vector so zero element so let so this is property 4 let's see if this is getting satisfied property 4 demands that let x y be a vector uh, be an element in capital v the addition is the same as the addition in the vector space r2 so we know what to expect and hence minus x minus y uh, is a candidate right then minus x comma minus y is an element of capital v and x comma y plus minus x comma minus y is just x minus x x plus minus x which is x minus x y plus minus x which is y minus y which is nothing but the zero element so yes property 4 also is satisfied every vector v has an additive inverse what was the fifth property the fifth property is the existence of multiplicative identity so property 5 so let us look at a vector v which is say x y in capital v so an element in capital v is being taken we would like to check so is so v be equal to this so what was the multiplicative uh, identity demanding it was demanding that 1 times v is equal to v for all v in capital v right this is what we should like uh, we would like to check but what is 1 times x comma y so to do that let us go and uh, recollect what was the definition of the scalar multiplication which I am now underlining in the green here so any scalar c times x comma y is giving us back x comma 0 as you can see so 1 times x comma y will give you back x comma 0 so it does not matter what c is right every scalar should give you back the vector which is the first coordinate and 0 is put in the second coordinate so this is the definition right by definition this is what it is but if y is not equal to 0 then x y is not equal to x 0 right so this however if say x comma y is the vector 2 comma 3 let us say 3 not equal to 0 right so 1 times 2 comma 3 here by definition is equal to 2 comma 0 which is 
not equal to 2 comma 3 we should have got 2 comma 3 if the property 5 is to be satisfied so hence property 5 is not satisfied it's not satisfied so therefore therefore v is not a vector space with these operations we have already solved the problem establishing that with these operations we cannot be a vector space because the multiplicative uh, identity the property involving the multiplicative identity is not getting satisfied well out of curiosity we could ask what about the remaining properties it, dis it does not matter because we have already established that uh, V is uh, not a vector space. However, out of just to satisfy our curiosity, let us look at the remaining properties as well. Property 6, property 6 was about the multiplicative associativity, right. So, if you look at A, B times say x comma y, let me now do a quick uh, observation. This is just going to be any vector uh, sorry any scalar times x comma y by the scalar multiplication is just going to be x comma 0 the first coordinate and the 0 in the second coordinate. But we demand that this be equal to a times b of x comma y right and what is this this is just a times x comma 0 b of b times x comma y is x comma 0 and a times x comma 0 will again be equal to x comma 0. So, yes this is equal if you can if you notice this is equal. Therefore, property 6 is actually getting satisfied. So, that is interesting. So, even though property 5 is not satisfied, property 6 is still getting satisfied. How about property 7? Property 7 demands that a plus b times x comma y, let us see what this is this is equal to it does not matter what a plus b say c, c times x y is just going to be x comma 0 and uh, what is a times x comma y plus b times x comma y. Oh, this was property 8 I guess. So, let me just put it here property 8 satisfies or rather whether it is satisfied or not let us check. So, this is going to be equal to x comma 0 plus x comma 0 which is actually equal to x plus x comma 0 which is 2 x comma 0 right. So, this is not necessarily if x is say non 0 then this is not going to get satisfied. So, for example, look at uh, 1 plus 1 on 1 comma 2 this uh, by uh, the, the first part will or rather direct. So, this is just 2 times so let me not use the green this is just 2 times 1 comma 2 which is equal to 1 comma 0 by the scalar multiplication any scalar times a vector will just give you the same coordinate in the first uh, uh, so it is the same first coordinate right. But what about 1 times 1 comma 2 plus 1 times 1 comma 2 this is just going to be equal to 1 0 plus 1 0 which is equal to 2 comma 0. This is not equal as you can notice and therefore, property 8 is not getting satisfied. So, we have one more property which is not, not getting satisfied, not satisfied. Actually, uh, let me not uh, now bother about property 7, but let me just tell you that uh, or maybe I will just write it. We need to check that a times x1 y1 plus x2 y2 this is equal to a times x1 plus x2 y1 plus y2 which is equal to x1 plus x2 comma 0. And what should this be equal to? This should be equal to a times x1 y1 plus a times x2 y2. But what is that? That is equal to x1 comma 0 plus x2 comma 0 which is equal to x1 plus x2 0 which actually are equal 
and therefore property 7 is satisfied. So, if you start worrying about all the properties, we will notice that the fifth property and the eighth property are not satisfied. Even if one of the properties are not satisfied, it cannot be a vector space. We just checked the remaining three properties out of curiosity, I would say. All right, so we have completed uh, the first problem and concluded that the set V with the vector space operations as defined in the problem cannot be a vector space. Okay, now let us look at the next problem. Problem 2. Prove that the set W1, which is say x, y, z in R3 such that 2x plus 3y plus z is equal to 0 is a subspace. of R3, however, W2 which is the set of all x, y, z in R3 such that 2x plus 3y plus z is equal to 1 is not a subspace of R3. So, after looking through the solution, you will notice that 2x plus 3y plus z is equal to any non-zero number, not necessarily 1. You look at wk to be equal to x, y, z in R3 such that 2x plus 3y plus z is equal to k, that will not be a subspace. It has to be equal to 0, otherwise it will not be a subspace. The same proof will go through. So, let us look at a solution. So, this is more like a, a proof that, so let us call it a proof. So, W1 is a subspace of R3, that is what we would like to prove here. But what, when does some subset become a subspace? You recall the definition, it is going to be a subspace if in the borrowed vector space operations, it is closed under both the operations. So, enough to show, to, to check that W1 is a subspace enough to show that W1 is closed under the vector addition and scalar multiplication which is borrowed from capital V. So, let us take two elements and look for whether vector addition of those two elements in W1 gives us back an element in W1. So, let x1, y1, z1 and x2, y2, z2 be two vectors in W1. What does it mean to say that something is in W1? Let me go back and uh, remind you what W1 is, W1 is the set of all x, y, z such that 2x plus 3y plus z is equal to 0. So, this implies 2x1 plus 3y1 plus z1 is equal to 0 and this implies the fact that it the x2, y2, z2 is in W1 implies that 2x2 plus 3y2 plus z2 is equal to the scalar 0. We would like to see what happens to x1, y1, z1 plus x2, y2, z2, whether this particular vector is in w, but what is the vector addition of this? This is component wise addition if you recall. This is going to give you x1 plus x2, y1 plus y2, z1 plus z2. And let us see if uh, this belongs to the set W1, but what is the requirement for uh, this particular element to be in W1? It should uh, satisfy the 
condition that 2 x 1 plus x 2 plus 3 y 1 plus y 2 plus z 1 plus z 2 this should be equal to 0 if at all this sum should be in uh, w 1. So, so then this is what will happen then this is equal to let us write it out this is 2 x 1 plus 2 x 2 plus 3 y 1 plus 3 y 2 plus z 1 plus z 2. Notice that all these are scalars 2 x 1 is a real number 2 x 2 is a real number 3 y 1 is a real number 3 y 2 is a real number and so on and the vector addition is uh, uh, commutative and using that we can write this as 2x1 plus 3y1 plus z1 plus 2x2 plus 3y2 plus z2. Let us just go up. Notice that by whatever I am putting now as star, this is equal to 0 plus 0 by star, which is equal to 0. And therefore, x1 y 1 z 1 plus x 2 y 2 z 2 belongs to capital W by what we have just observed. So, yes W is closed under the vector addition which is borrowed from R 3. How about scalar multiplication? We have already seen similar uh, ideas. So, let uh, x y z be in capital W 1 and c be in R then what is this? This is equal to c x, c y, c z and let us look at whether this vector in the right c x, c y, c z does it belong to the vector space w. So, we need to look for 2 times c x plus 3 times c y plus c z is equal to 0 which is oh, c z is this equal to 0 that is the question. I will just write it as c times 2x plus 3y plus z, but we know that 2x plus 3y plus z is 0 because xyz belongs to w1 and this is equal to c times 0 which is equal to 0. So, yes, so this implies w1 is a subspace. Now, what happens to w2? So, I would say that w2, let me do one thing, let me note this part as maybe a star. I am going to use the star to conclude. So, now is w2 is a is w2 a subspace that is what we would like to answer or rather we would like to prove that w2 is not a subspace. So, in order to do that we should show that it is not closed under either vector addition or the scalar multiplication. So, let us take x1, y1 and z1 in w2 and x2, y2, z2 which is in w2. We would like to see if the vector addition is in w2, but we already checked this out right. What is x1, y1 plus sorry x1, y1, z1 plus x2, y2, z2? This is just equal to x1 plus y1. Let me not, let me quickly write it and we would like to see whether this belongs to w2. What is w2? Recall that w2 is defined in this manner. So, I am underlining it in green 2x plus 3y plus z. The sum of the coordinates with these linear combinations should be equal to 1. That is the requirement. So, let us look at 2 times x1 plus x2 plus 3 times y1 plus y2 plus z1 plus z2. Now, let me show you what was put in star. Yeah, so maybe this is what I would like to put in star. This tells us that this is equal to 2x1. Same argument tells us that this is equal to 2x1 plus 3y1 plus z1 plus 2x2 plus 3y2 plus z2. But what is 2x1 plus 3y1 plus z1? That is equal to 1 because x1, y1, z1 belongs to w1. Similarly, this is also equal to 
1 and the sum of these two will give you 2. But what was our requirement? Our requirement was that this vector if you look at 2 times the first coordinate plus 3 times the second coordinate plus the third coordinate we should have got 1 for it to be in the vector subspace. Here we are getting 2 and therefore hence w2 is not. So, this vector is the vector sum is not in w2, w2 is not closed under vector addition. So, w2 is not a subspace and hence and therefore not a subspace. If you had taken scalar multiplication and checked even that would not have uh, landed up here, it will give you something like c times 1 right and therefore not a subspace. So, even if one of the two conditions are not satisfied, it will not be a subspace. All right, so we have proved uh, or rather completed problem 2. Okay, so the next problem is in the vector space of all functions from a set to R. So, let S be a subset of the real numbers and w be the set of all f in f of s comma r such that f of s naught is equal to 0 for a fixed x naught in capital S. So, what is f of s comma r? Recall I will come to that. So, then prove that w is a subspace of f of s comma r. Okay, let us look at a solution to this problem, rather proof because this is a proof, prove that problem. So, let us call it a proof. So, what was f of uh, s comma r? Recall that f of s comma r is the set of all functions from s to r and what was the vector addition and scalar multiplication there? It was point wise. So, with the uh, vector addition, if you take two functions and if you look at f plus g, we would like to say that it is a function from s to r right. So, we will define what this is at a point s in capital S, this is just f of s plus g of s which makes it into an honest function from s into r. And what about c f of s we just so for this is for f comma g in f of s comma r and this is equal to c times f of s where f is in capital F of s comma r and c is in. So, so, this is the vector addition and scalar multiplication which we had uh, defined during the lectures and it was left as an exercise for you to check that this is indeed a vector space. So, like in the first problem you should have checked for whether it is closed under vector addition and scalar multiplication and seen what the properties 1 to 8, uh, whether pro pro properties 1 to 8 are indeed getting satisfied. Yeah, in the process you would have had to guess what the uh, additive identity is, what the inverse of a given function is and so on, but they are all quite straightforward. Okay, so, our goal here in this problem is to show that we are given a very particular uh, subset. This is the set of all those functions f from s to r where f satisfies the condition that f of s naught is equal to 0, where s naught is some fixed point. So, if say s is the open interval 0 1 and s is s naught is half, this will just turn out to be all functions from 0 1 to r such so that f of half is equal to 0, one such example of, okay. Okay, so we will show that w is always a subspace, again like in the previous problem, we just have to show that w is closed under vector addition and scalar multiplication, but that is quite straightforward. So, let f comma g be in capital W. This implies that f of s naught is 0, 
and g of s naught is 0. Okay, so now let us look at the vector addition of f plus g and look at what is the value at s naught. But by the definition f plus g of s naught is equal to f of s naught plus g of s naught which is equal to 0 plus 0 which is equal to 0. So therefore, which implies that f plus g belongs to capital W. How about scalar multiplication C f times s naught? So, this is for then for f g in w and c in r. So, this is what is getting satisfied. C f at s naught is equal to c times f of s naught, but f is in capital W means that f of s naught is 0, this implies this is c times 0 which is equal to 0. Hence, c f is in W. So, W is closed under both vector addition and scalar multiplication. W is hence a subspace of f of s comma r. Next uh, let us do a problem which is similar to one of the assignment problems. Problem 4 demands that we check whether the first vector can be written down as a linear combination of the other two vectors. So, check whether the first vector is a linear combination of the other two vectors in the following. The first one is minus 2, 2, 2, 1, 2, minus 1, minus 3, minus 3, 3 in R 3. And how about the second one? Let us just do two of them. This is just going to be x cube minus 8x square plus 4x, <coughs> x cube minus 2x square plus 3x minus 1, x cube minus 2x plus 3. This is in P3 of R. Okay, so we need to check whether the first vector can be written as a linear combination of the other two vectors. Let us look for whether it can be done. So, solution. So, we would like to see if so want a comma b in the field of scalars such that minus 2 2 2 is equal to a times 1 2 minus 1. Maybe I should just change this. This makes it uh, no, this is not going to make it easy. Plus b times minus 3, minus 3, 3. Yeah, so let us see if uh, we can do that or want to check. Let me just reword what I want. Want to check for the existence of of a comma b in R such that this happens. Okay, so let us write it down. Let us write down what this means. What is the right hand side here? The right hand side just tells us that this is equal to a plus minus 3b which is a minus 3b. This is 2a minus 3b and minus of a plus 3b. So, what we want is a solution for the system of equations which is written down here 2 and minus of a plus 3b is equal to 2. Okay. So, what can we say from here a minus 3b is equal to minus 2 these 2 directly implies 
a minus 2 is equal to 2 which implies a is equal to 4 and this implies 2 times 4 minus 3b is equal to 2 oh sorry 8 minus 3b is equal to 2 which implies b is equal to minus of 6 by minus 3 which is 2 and uh, is it consistent here we have minus of 4 plus 3 into 2 is 6 which is equal to 2 yeah so yes so so my claim is so a equal to 4 b equal to 2 will satisfy the relevant equations that has been written down. So, let us see. So, hence easy to check that minus 2, 2, 2 is equal to 4 times 1, 2, minus 1 plus 2 times minus 3, minus 3, 3. So, yes, therefore, we can write the first vector as a linear combination of the other two in R3. Okay, how about the next one? Okay, so let me write this down here. So, this is 2. So, let us now see what 2 is. 2 was x cube minus 8x, uh, 8x square plus 4x plus 3, x cube minus 2x square plus 3x minus 1. and x cube minus 2x plus 3. This in P3 of R, all polynomials of degree less than or equal to 3. Okay, so, if uh, we can indeed do that, so want to check if there exist a comma b in R such that x cube minus 8x square plus 4x is equal to a times x cube minus x square, I am sorry, x square plus 3x minus 1 plus b times x cube minus 2x plus 3. But what does this mean? This means what is the right hand side? This is equal to a plus b times x cube plus minus of 2a times x square plus 3a minus 2b times x plus 3b minus a. So, this is exactly what the right hand side is going to be. We would like to see if there exist a and b such that the right hand side is equal to the left hand side here. Okay, so, what does this imply? By equating the coefficients of the monomials involved, we have a plus b is equal to 1, minus of 2a is equal to minus of 8, 3a minus 2b is equal to 4, 3b minus a is equal to 0. Okay, so let us see. This implies, so let us see the first second equation minus 2a is equal to minus 8 implies a is equal to minus of 8 by minus 2 which is equal to 4 and a plus b is equal to 1 implies b is equal to 1 minus 4 which is equal to minus 3. Now, let us see if uh, the final two. So, this two implies this. Let us see if the next two equations are consistent. If it is not, then we do not have a linear combination, right. So, basically with a equal to 4 and b equal to minus 3, let us look for whether the third and the fourth equation are satisfied, okay. So, what is this going to be? This is just going to be 4 into 3, 12 minus 2 into minus 3, which is 6, which is equal to 18, which is not equal to 4. So, there, there cannot be a consistent choice of a and b, which satisfies all these equations. So, we do not even need to bother about whether the fourth equation can be satisfied. So, the first two equation forces a to be 4 and b to be minus 3, but with 4 and minus 3, the third equation cannot be satisfied. Hence, 
there does not exist a comma b in r such that well the first point i'll let me not so let me put it this way such that star is satisfied okay so we have checked for one case where the first vector could be written down as a linear combination of the other two and another in which the first vector cannot be written down as a linear combination of the other two okay so the next problem involves the span so let me call it problem 5 yes so let s1 s2 be subsets of a vector space v prove that span of s1 intersected with s2 is contained in the span of s1 intersected with span of s2 moreover give an example when one span of s1 intersected with s2 is equal to span of s1 intersected with span of s2 and 2 when the span of s1 intersected with s2 is a strict subset of span of s1 intersected with span of s2 so the problem not only demands us to prove some statement it also asks us to come up with an example this uh, this is uh, one of the cases where you will have to sit down and look at uh, various examples you have already seen look for examples of the span and see whether you know the conditions are being satisfied or not this is a good problem for you to think about the various vector spaces uh, that you have already seen so this is this is an interesting problem in that sense okay so let's look at a solution so we need to check for the span of s1 intersected with s2 being a subset of span of s1 intersected with span of s2 so let's take how do we go about proving such a statement we take some arbitrary element in the left and prove that it is also necessarily an element in the right but here it's quite straightforward so let v be in span of s1 intersected with s2 what does it mean for a vector v to be in the span of some s1 intersected with s2 that means that there exists some v1 v2 of the vk in s1 intersected with s2 such that v is a linear combination of v1 v2 up to vk ie there exist v1 to vk in s1 intersected with s2 and a1 to ak scalars such that v is equal to a1 v1 plus a2 v2 plus up to ak vk okay and what is our goal our goal is to show that v is in the span of s1 intersected with span of s2 okay so what does it mean to say that uh, v1 v2 up to vk belongs to s1 intersected with s2 this implies in particular that v1 to vk belongs to s1 as well it belongs to both s1 and s2 that is what it means for it to be in the intersection so in particular it belongs to s1 and since span of s1 is going to consist of all linear combinations of the uh, vectors in s1 this implies So this implies a1 v1 plus up to a k v k belongs to the span of s1 by a very similar argument though this is uh, by a similar argument instead of s1 if you had just picked s2 
you would have got that a1 v1 plus a2 v2 up to a k v k belongs to span of s2 as well. So, in particular it belongs to both span of s1 and span of s2 and therefore it belongs to the intersection. So, we used two aspects here, the one I am underlining in green was because uh, V is in the span of S, one uh, span of S1 intersected with S2 and therefore there exists some A1, A2 up to AK such that V is a linear combination of V1 to VK. And the one I am underlining in green right now follows because every linear combination of V1, V2 up to VK which are in S1 should also be in the span of S1. So, both the aspects are being used to establish this proof. But that is precisely what we wanted right, uh, in fact we have established the proof is the point. So, this vector which I have just underlined is uh, the vector V. So, this implies V is in span of S1 intersected with span of S2. So, we take any arbitrary vector in span of S1 intersected with S2 that will be in span of S1 intersected with span of S2. Therefore, or rather hence span of S1 intersected with S2 is contained in span of S1 intersected with span of S2. Okay, so, now we have proved one part. So, we have established this part. So, what is left is to give examples of when span of S1 intersected with S2 is equal to the span of S1 intersected with span of S2 and one when it is not equal. So, I will not uh, go too much into it, let me just give you the examples straight away and le let me leave it for you to check that if, so the first case where it is equal, let me just uh, take the simple vector space that can come to, that we can consider which is say R2 or maybe R3. In R3, consider S1 to be say the vector 1 0 0 0 1 0 and 1 1 0. This is our S1 and what about S2? S2 is 0 1 0 0 1 1 0 well, 1, 2, 0. So, you should check that well, span of what is S1 intersected with S2? S1 intersected with S2 is equal to 0, 1, 0, 1, 1, 0. And what is the span of S1 intersected with S2? This will be all linear combinations of uh, the vectors written to the right and you should check that this is the set of all x, y, z in R3 such that z is equal to 0. In fact, you should check that span of S1 is also, so let me call this W is also equal to W which is the same as span of S2. So, yes, so this is a case where all three are equal and therefore span of S1 intersected with S2 is equal to span of S1 intersected with span of S2. How about the second case? Yeah, actually we could have also arranged for uh, a case where uh, you know all the three are not equal and still we have this, but I will leave that uh, as, a, as a thing to think about for you. This is just after all picking the right vectors, you should pick various choices and see how it works out. How about the second one? So, let me just give you an example and leave the rest to you. We would like to get hold of an S1 and S2 such that span of S1 intersected with S2 is a strict subset of uh, span of S1 and span of S2. 
that is uh, not difficult. Well, we just take, uh, let us do this, let us look at in R2, let S1 be equal to the vectors E1, E2, which is 1, 0, 0, 1. and S2 be the set 1 comma 1, 1 comma minus 1 and let me leave it uh, for you to check that span of S1 is equal to span of S2 is equal to R2. By now you know that this is a basis right and therefore the intersection is also R2 but what is S1 intersected with S2? This is empty and span of S1 intersected with S2 is just the span of the empty set which is the 0 subspace. So, yes this is a clear case where it is a proper subspace or rather it is a subspace which is not equal to span of S1 intersected with span of S2. Okay. The next problem uh, demands that we check whether a particular set is linearly independent or not. So, problem 6. check whether the following set what is the set here the set here is 1 1 0 0 0 0 0 0 0 1 1 0 0 0 0 0 0 1 1 1 1 1 0 0 0 0 0 0 1 1 1. So, check whether this following set S is linearly dependent in which is the vector space this is in the vector space of all 3 cross 2 matrices over Okay, so solution. So, what do we need to do to check whether a given given set is linearly independent or not? We should check for whether there exists a linear combination of it which is equal to 0. Okay, so suppose there is a linear combination. So, let a1, a2, okay, we, we would like to, so to check whether S is linearly dependent or independent either way, we want to check for the existence, the existence of what? The existence of scalars A1, A2, how many are there? 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, A1, A2, A3 up to A5 in the field of scalars such that the linear combination a1 times 11000 0, 0, 0, 0, plus a2 times 0, 0, 001100 0, 0, plus a3 times 0, 0, 0, 0, 1, 1, plus a4 times 0, 0, 0, 1, 0, 1, 0, 1, 0, plus a5 times 0, 0, 0, 1, 1, 0 is o oh, right what is the zero vector here Remember that the vector space that we are talking about is the vector space of all 3 cross 2 vectors, sorry 3 cross 2 matrices over R and the 0 vector there is the 0 matrix which consists of the 0 as its entries. So, this is just the 0 vector which is 0 0 0 0 0 0. This is precisely what we would like to check whether there exists a1, a2, a3, a4, a5 such that this linear combination is the 0 right now. Okay, so, if we are to translate it using the uh, vector addition and uh, the scalar multiplication that is involved in m3 cross 2 of r which is basically component wise in both the cases. So, this is just going to be let me write down the answer directly this is going to be a1 plus a4, a1 plus a5, this is a2 plus a4, a2 plus a5, a3 plus a4 a3 plus a5 this is the matrix to the left after doing the 
uh, calculations and this we are demanding to be equal to the zero vector in this vector space of uh, 3 cross 2 matrices over R. So, this is what the demand is. But what does that mean? This, this means that component wise they are equal that means A1 plus A4 is 0, A2 plus A4 is 0, A3 plus A4 is 0 and the 3 implies that A1 is equal to A2 is equal to A3 and uh, how about the other one A1 plus A5 is equal to 0 and this also tells us that A4 is equal to minus of A1 whatever the value of that is. This is also A2 plus A5 equal to 0, A3 plus A5 equal to 0 which implies that A1 is equal to A2 is equal to A3 again which is consistent and a5 is equal to minus of a1. So, in particular if a1 is equal to 1 then a1, a2, a3 are all 1, a4 is minus 1 and a5 is also minus 1. So, then what do we have? Then let us check for 1, 1, 0, 0, 0, 0 plus 0, 0, 1, 1, 0, 0 plus 0, 0, 0, 0, 1, 1 plus minus 1 times 1, 1, 1, 0, 0, 0 or rather 1, 0, 1, 0, 1, 0 plus minus 1 times 0, 1, 0, 1, 0, 1. This will just turn out to be the 0 vector which is true and therefore this set is linearly dependent. Hence, S is linearly dependent. The next problem demands that we check for a subset to be linearly independent. So, this is problem 7. So, let S be a set of non-zero polynomials in P of R let us do one thing let us put it as a finite set let us be a finite set I do not need to impose this you should think about why uh, this is true when it is not uh, imposed the finiteness condition is not imposed this should still be true, but nevertheless, let us be a finite set of non-zero polynomials in P of R such that no two polynomials have the same degree. So, if one polynomial is a x square plus 1, then the other polynomials none of them can have degree 2 because x square plus 1 is already having degree 2. So, all the polynomials have distinct degrees. If, if at all there is a polynomial of say degree 2, there will be only one polynomial which has degree 2. So, they have distinct degrees, okay. So, no two of them have the same degree. Then prove that S is linearly independent. So, as much as the problem might sound sophisticated, it is actually quite simple to prove if you make the right observations. So, let us give a proof or a solution to this problem. So, we know that S has, S is a finite set which has distinct degrees, right. So, what we will do is we will pick the polynomial in S which has least degree. So, let P1 be the polynomial in S with least degree. Let us say it is D1. P2 similarly be the polynomial which has least degree however greater than D1. We know that least degree is D1. So, let us let P2 be the polynomial in S with 
degree with degree d2 with the least degree let's call this degree yeah degree let's call it call the degree let degree of p1 be equal to d1 so d2 so degree least degree greater than d1 so there will be only one such polynomial and let degree of p2 be equal to d2 so notice that d1 is less than d2 and so on so pick p k so therefore after finitely many steps after finitely many such steps in the above algorithmic process we have s is equal to p1 p2 up to say pk there are finitely many of them such that degree of pi is equal to di and d1 is less than d2 is less than d2 d3 less than dot 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 bk so pk has the highest degree and p k minus 1 has degree less than the degree of pk and so on okay now we are almost done suppose a1 p1 plus a2 p2 plus up to ak pk is equal to 0 then what do we know let me ask you what the degree so let this be equal to q check what will be the coefficient of x to the power dk will be equal check that this is equal to a k because a 1 a 2 up to a k minus 1 do not have x to the power d k in its polynomial expression because all of them have degree less than d k only x to p k has the monomial x to the power d k and therefore the coefficient of uh, p k would be a k times the so ok so I have to be a bit more careful times uh, the coefficient of x to the power d k in p k which is a non zero number. So, let us do one thing let us call it b k where b k is equal to the coefficient of x to the power d k in p k of x. But we know that we are looking at this being equal to the zero polynomial by Hence, equating the coefficients, this implies that a k b k is equal to 0, but we know that b k is not equal to 0. Why? Because p k has degree x to the power uh, t, p k has degree d k and therefore, if its coefficient is 0, then we cannot have its degree to be equal to uh, d k, right? Uh, this implies a k is equal to 0. Why? Let me just note down the reason since b k is not equal to 0 or rather since b k equal to 0 implies that degree of p k is not equal to d k. But we know that degree of p k is equal to d k and therefore b k cannot be 0 and therefore a k has to be necessarily 0. Okay, so let us get back to our star we have just established that a k is 0. This implies that a 1 p 1 plus a 2 p 2 plus up to a k minus 1 p k minus 1 this is equal to the 0 polynomial because a k is 0 the last polynomial does not contribute. But by a similar argument we can conclude that a k minus 1 is also equal to 0 and so on and by by a similar argument now once a k minus 1 is 0 inductively we can say that now okay a 1 a 2 by repeating the process above 
not inductive let me just say repeating the above process we have a1 or rather ak equal to ak minus 1 equal to up to a1 equal to 0. But that is precisely what we wanted to prove if you notice if there is a linear combination of p1, p2 up to pk equal to 0, we have just established that the coefficients are necessarily 0. This implies that S is linearly independent. So, the next problem is uh, about proving whether a given subset is a basis of the given vector space. So, this is problem 8. So, determine whether the following subsets or following sets are basis for the vector space or subspace W of O of R such that 2A plus B plus C is equal to say 0. So, where is this a subspace? A subspace W in P2 of R. So, we are ok. So, what are these sets? Let us see. The first set is S which is given by x square minus 2 x square minus 2x or rather plus 2x minus 3, <coughs> 2, s is equal to 3x square minus 2x minus 1, so this is 2a plus b minus c, So, s is equal to 3 x square minus 2 x minus 4 x square minus x minus 1 2 x square or other minus 2 x square plus x uh, minus 2 4 plus 3 and third one would be s to be say x square minus 2 minus 2 x square plus x plus 3 let us take these 3. Okay, so, we need to check whether the following subsets are basis of w. What was w? Let me just put w in your view. w is the set of all those polynomials in P2 of R whose coefficients satisfy some relation. So, what do we need to uh, check whether something uh, is indeed a basis? of uh, w we need to check that first condition is to see whether it is linearly independent and the second condition would be to check whether uh, they span our given set all right so let's do that so solution so the first problem uh, let's do both let s be x square minus 2 x square plus 2x minus 3 so, linear independence. So, let a comma b be scalars such that a times x square minus 2 plus b times x square plus 2x minus 3 is equal to 0, the 0 polynomial. So, that would imply a plus b times x square plus 2 b x 
plus minus of 2a minus of 3b is equal to 0. But what does it mean to say that a polynomial is 0? All its coefficients are 0. This implies 2b is equal to 0 and hence b is equal to 0. And the first one a plus b is equal to 0 implies a is also equal to 0 which is inconsistent with minus of 2a plus minus, minus of 3b equal to 0. So yes, this forces a and b to be equal to 0. Hence, s is linearly independent. Yes, so the first thing to note which I just skipped is to check whether s is a subset of w. x square minus 2, if you, if you notice, x square minus 2 will just satisfy 2a minus 2a plus b plus c should be 0, so 2 minus 2 is 0, yes, and 2, uh, 2a is 2, 2 plus 2 minus 3, yeah, so this is a problem, this cannot be in, oh no, this is bad. 2 plus 2, 4 minus 2, this should have been something like minus 4 or something. So let me just do one thing, let me tweak it so that you know I gain what I want. So it has to be 4, notice that if it is not 4, that vector will not be in W. So let me come down and slightly change everything. Well. I would like to have that this particular vector is in in W because uh, otherwise we can straight away say that these vectors are not even in W and hence it cannot be a basis. But yeah, so at least let us make it a little more challenging by taking two vectors in W and checking for whether it is a basis. So yes, this is now in this case, uh, let us check once more x square plus 2x minus 4 will satisfy 2 plus 2 plus minus 4 which is 0. Yes, so this is uh, a subset of w and uh, this argument which would not have been uh, which is not disturbed at all. So let me let us go back once more and check line by line. Suppose you have a linear combination which is equal to 0 and grouping for the coefficients we get a plus b is 0, 2b is 0 minus of 2a minus 4b is 0 or rather a plus 2b is 0. But all the the first two forces both a and b to be 0 and it is consistent with the third. Therefore, a and b are forced to be 0 therefore s is a linearly independent set. But we are only halfway through. We have just shown that s is a linearly independent subset of w. And the question is whether uh, s is a basis. So, we have to check for whether it is a spanning set. Let me not uh, check brute force that this is a spanning set, I would rather uh, use an indirect argument to conclude that it is a spanning set. So if S is, so what is the uh, meaning of S being linearly independent? That means that dimension of W is greater than or equal to 2. Why is that the case? The, that is because uh, every linearly independent set is contained in a basis. And therefore, S being linearly independent means that there exists a basis of uh, W which contains S and therefore it should have at least size 2. So, dimension of W should be greater than or equal to 2. If S is not a spanning set, so if S is not a spanning set, then there exists some polynomial P in capital W such that P is not in span of what were the two polynomials or span of S, let me just call it S, span of S, right, that is what it means. And therefore, S union P is linearly independent and that would imply that dimension of W is at least 3, but it cannot be more than 3 because P2 of R has dimension 3 which is equal to the dimension of P2 of R. And what do we know about subspaces of P2 of R which has dimension equal to 3? It has to be necessarily equal to P2 of R. 
is implies that w is equal to p2 of r but this is a contradiction why is this a contradiction because every element in p2 of r does not satisfy the equation of the coefficients which i am now underlining in green for example you look at 2x square 2x square has coefficients 2 for x square and 0 and 0 so the 2a plus b plus c will give us 4 which is not equal to 0 so p2 of r every element of p2 of r does not satisfy this uh, relation when it comes to coefficients and therefore what was our assumption so we proved this problem which apparently looked uh, very numerical by a contradiction argument so what was the yeah so if if s is not a spanning set this was the assumption we started off with and we arrived at a contradiction and therefore ns S is a spanning set. That means S is both a spanning set and a linearly independent set, which implies that S is a basis of W. All right, so we now have okay, we can conclude something more. This means that the dimension of W is equal to 2. dimension of w is equal to 2 ok good because if you look at 2 which I have just underlined in green s is a subset of I hope it is a subset of w so notice that s has 3 elements from w and we know that dimension of w is equal to 2 and therefore you take any subset of w which has more than 2 elements it should necessarily be linearly dependent right by one of the consequences so let me say this s cannot be linearly independent since by one of the consequences of the replacement theorem the size of any linearly independent subset of W should be less than or equal to or let me write it like this cannot be greater than the dimension of W. And S has three elements which is more than the dimension of W and therefore S is not a basis. Okay, so now let us come to problem number 3. Problem number 3 has two vectors x square minus 2 and minus 2 x square plus x plus 3 minus 2 x square minus 4 plus 1 plus 3 is 0. Yes, so this is a subset of S which consists of two vectors we would like to see whether it is a basis again by one of the consequences of replacement theorem it is enough to check whether a subset of w of uh, size 2 is linearly independent or rather let me put it this way to, to check that s is a basis of w it is enough to check for either linear independence or the spanning property so let me note what i just said by a corollary to the replacement theorem to check whether S is a basis, it is enough to check for linear independence. And why is that the case? Because since S has dimension of W equal to two elements. So if this set is linearly independent, it is necessarily a spanning set. We could have done the other way also, we could have just checked for spanning property and any spanning set which has a dimension of W elements 
should necessarily be linearly independent as well. We will just check for linear independence. What was the set S? S was x square minus 2 minus 2 x square plus x plus 3. And the check for linear independence is straightforward if a times x square minus 2 plus b times minus 2 x square plus x plus 3 is equal to 0. This would imply a minus 2b times x square plus bx plus 3b minus 2a is equal to 0. And from this we have a minus 2b is equal to 0, b is equal to 0. 3b minus 2a is equal to 0. The second equation already tells us that b is equal to 0 and along with the second equation both first or third which is consistent tells us that a is equal to 0 and b is equal to 0. Therefore, we have established that it is linearly independent and therefore, it is automatically a spanning set and which makes it into a basis of W. So, the next problem demands that we determine whether what the dimension of our given subspace is. Okay, so the problem 9. For a fixed scalar A or rather C, for the fixed scalar C, let W be the set of all polynomials in P n of R such that P of C is equal to 0. Check that this is a subspace, here yeah, subspace. of P n of R. Find or determine the dimension of W. Okay, so let us look at a solution. So, of course, one needs to check that W is indeed a subspace even though it is being said that it is a subspace it is our job to check that that is a subspace because otherwise so there is no question of finding the dimension but yeah. So, let us uh, as of now uh, let me leave that as an exercise for you to check that it is indeed a subspace. Our goal in this problem however, is to determine the dimension of W. Okay, so, what is W precisely? W is the set of all polynomials is that P vanishes at C. So, we know from our basic algebra we know that if p of c is equal to 0, then p of x is what this is going to be x minus c times q of x, where degree of q of x is degree of p of x minus 1. So, this is exactly what uh, our uh, p of x will look like. So, in particular, uh, if q of x, you look at any polynomial of the type x minus c times q of x that will satisfy the condition that it vanishes at C. So, it is it's if and only if in some, in some sense. So, P of C is 0, we know that let me put it this way, P of C is 0 if and only if this is the case. So, if you look at Q of x varying over all pol polynomials with say degree 1 to degree 0 to n minus 1. So, this is uh, P n of r which is up to degree n. So, in particular if q of x is any polynomial up to degree n minus 1, we should be able to get hold of this. So, that gives us a natural candidate. So, let me put as a claim s be equal to 1 times x minus c which is x minus c, x times x minus c, x square times x minus c, x to the power n minus 1 times x minus c. This is a potential candidate, is a basis of W. So, I just described the motivation to guess or conjecture that this particular set will be a basis. So, the fact that S is linearly independent uh, follows from one of the problems we have just proved. That S is linearly independent follow 
was from let's see which problem was it problem 7 what is that problem 7 said that if there are if there is a subset s which consists of polynomials which have different degrees no two of them have the same degrees same degrees then they should be linearly independent so notice that we have uh, we can we could have done this the same argument goes through in pn of r as well so let me write it i think problem 7 right so problem 7 why because this has degree 1 this is degree 2 this is degree 3 and this is degree n all these have different degrees so they are necessarily linearly independent and what is the size of n so that means dimension of w linearly independent where in w so all these are vectors in w and they are linearly independent therefore dimension of w should be greater than how many of them are there this is 0 1 2 up to n minus 1 so there are n of them greater than or equal to n so if dimension of w is not equal to n if dimension of w is greater than n it has to be n plus 1 right because p n of r has dimension n plus 1 this would imply dimension of w will be equal to n plus 1 which is equal to the dimension of p n of r we have used this type of an argument as well earlier in one of the problems but that would imply w is equal to p n of r the only subspace of p n of r which has dimension equal to n plus 1 is itself but that cannot happen because this is a contradiction because what was our w w was the collection of all those polynomials which vanishes at c so in particular if you look at uh, the constant polynomial 1 at c is equal to 1 which is not equal to 0 right so polyno constant polynomial non zero constant polynomials do not vanish at any point and w should necessarily vanish at every element in w should necessarily vanish at c vanish, vanish at I, c i mean p of c is equal to 0 so this is a contradiction which implies dimension of w so this assumption which i just under uh, which i just underlined cannot happen this implies dimension of w is equal to n but what do we have we have now s which is equal to oh we already have just proved that dimension of s is equal to uh, dimension of w is equal to n which is what uh, our goal was so also notice that s is indeed a spanning set right so yes so this is our solution to the problem 